I'm talking today with Associate Professor Andrew McIsaac, who, apart from being Director of Cardiology here at St Vincent's in Melbourne, is also President of the Cardiac Society of Australia and New Zealand. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure. It's nice to talk to you. You have written a very comprehensive editorial for our upcoming cardiology um, issue, which is coming out on the 1st of August, I believe. Uh, this issue coming up has got new guidelines for uh, the treatment of acute coronary syndromes. Um, tell us a little bit about mortality rates and, and why the guidelines needed a, re a revision. So myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndromes, remains a major cause of morbidity and mortality in our community and is clearly one of the leading causes of death. Uh, we've also made tremendous strides in the last 20 to 30 years in the treatment of these conditions and outcomes have improved significantly. So it's very important that patients get appropriate treatment because it really does make a big difference to their long-term outcome and their chance of dying. Yeah. There's still significant uh, mortality and morbidity from acute coronary syndrome. If you have a heart attack in Australia today, your chance of dying during your hospital admission is 4.5% according to the snapshot registry. Another 5.1% of patients have a, a recurrent myocardial infarction during that admission. But it's not only the in-hospital death rate, it's what happens during follow-up. And at 18 months, uh, about 16% of patients with both ST elevation and non-ST elevation myocardial infarctions uh, die. And about 6.8% of patients who present with acute coronary syndromes die by 18 months. So these are really big numbers mm -hmm. that uh, can hopefully be improved significantly. And the guidelines are aimed at um, uh, improving the outcome of these patients by putting forward the recommended treatments, systems and protocols to treat these patients. And what are some of the revisions that have been made? Well, some of the revisions that have been made to try and simplify how to treat someone coming in with a heart attack. We've always been aware that the sooner people are treated after the onset of a heart attack, the better their outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose in the more recent era of treatment, uh, many of these patients have been taken directly to cardiac cath labs and had what's called a primary PCI or percutaneous coronary intervention and the arteries open and stented. Of course, not all hospitals have the facilities to provide that. There's been debate about whether patients should be shipped to these hospitals or not or whether they should be treated with thrombolytic therapy, which is the alternative, mm -hmm. early on in the local hospital. There were confusing guidelines about the timing and how this should be done. These have been clarified and uh, I think this will make it much easier to set up appropriate systems of care. So what's the timeline now? We want to uh, have people uh, treated within 90 minutes of presenting to a hospital with a cardiac cath lab or thrombolyzed in a similar time. Uh, as long as they're within the first 12 hours of the onset of their symptoms, but clearly the quicker they go, the better. Yep. The other thing that we've had to take into account is that uh, uh, there are new forms of treatment available and there are, uh, in the, the journal, there was another article about hospital administered thrombolysis and actually treating people before they get to hospital with thrombolysis. And the outcomes of this have been uh, very promising indeed. And we need some more research to mm -hmm. compare that to uh, waiting to go to a hospital having a, a stenting procedure. But I think, uh, especially in rural and regional areas where we're a little bit remote, having early thrombolysis administered by the ambulance service is mm -hmm. extremely promising and, and will probably save a significant number of lives and uh, reduce morbidity. When is it appropriate to, to stent a, a patient who is stable? Well, patients with stable coronary artery disease, there's also been advances uh, in our understanding of the role of stenting in these patients. Uh, there's clear from many large trials that uh, stenting patients with stable angina is aimed at relieving their symptoms and aimed at relieving myocardial ischemia. Traditionally, cardiologists looked at coronary angiograms and made an objective assessment of how severe the narrowing was and whether it was bad enough to warrant stenting. Mm -hmm. We've now learnt that there's great variation in cardiologists' assessment of lesions, and one cardiologist may say something severe and needs a stent, Other cardi another cardiologist may say it's not so bad. Yeah. 
and there's been a lot of work looking at correlating this with the presence of ischemia in the myocardium. Right. And there's this new technique, relatively new technique, called using a special pressure wire put down the coronary artery called the uh, fractional flow reserve, which is an assessment of the perfusion of the myocardium. Right. And it's been shown that if you treat patients according to this very objective measure of how significant a lesion is, that you can really improve patient outcomes and better target stenting. So often patients with stable angina, it's very important to be guided by some sort of stress test to see whether there's ischemia in the heart and which lesion is causing that ischemia. Or now on the cath lab table, you can use the FFR wire. Mm -hmm. And that's why that article is in the MJA looking at the uptake of this new technology, uh, which has been used increasingly in the Australian uh, cardiological world to improve the targeting of treatment. Would you like to see it used more? Well, I think that it does need to be used more. Mm -hmm. We probably need better um, uh, assessment of who's going to benefit from stenting uh, beyond just some a subjective assessment of the coronary angiogram by the cardiologist. Mm -hmm. I think all the literature has indicated that the role of stenting in stable angina is to relieve angina, to relieve symptoms, and that it does this best when the lesion is, fairly, is significant, decreasing perfusion measured by FFR, or causing a more than 10% of the heart muscle, the myocardium, to be ischemic on a stress test. Secondary prevention. There are new technologies available. There's a low percentage of people who, who take up rehab in the way that you'd like, and, and there are very few who see it all the way through. Yes. What technologies are available now, and are they going to be useful in getting people to keep in their rehab? Well, I think there's a clear challenge in getting all patients to undergo cardiac rehab, uh, a challenge in maintaining patients on medications that are clearly going to improve their outcome, mm -hmm. such as aspirin and other antiplatelet agents, all the statins to lower your cholesterol, and ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin II receptor blockers that have also been shown to improve prognosis. We know many patients don't like taking tablets, especially if they feel well. An important role in cardiac rehab is to make sure people understand the importance of secondary prevention in doing that. We also need people to understand they need to modify their lifestyles, stop smoking, alter their diet, and exercise more with the aim of having a balanced diet and uh, and maintaining their ideal body weight. Cardiac rehab plays a really important role in getting these messages across. Some people don't want to hear these messages, whether that's why they don't go to cardiac rehab. Also, there are, is a question. Also, there are funding issues in the Australian healthcare system about yep. who's funding cardiac rehabilitation. It sort of falls after hospitals, not necessarily funded by hospitals. If you've got private insurance, it might be funded, but if you're a public patient, who's going to fund it for you? Yeah. And then we have lots of people in Australia who live in remote and regional areas that might be some distance away from their cardiac rehab program. So uh, the use of apps, iPhone technology, uh, may be very beneficial in delivering these messages to people. And uh, video conferencing may also be one. There have been data I'm not an expert in megadata, but we hear this word all the time, tracking patient populations from where their iPhones go, seeing yep. how often people do go to the gym versus how often do they go to the fast food outlet. All this information is all being collected. Yeah. It may overcome some of these, these obstacles. I think there's a lot of promise, but we're not at the point yet of saying that traditional cardiac rehab programs can be replaced by these technologies, but I'm hopeful they'll at least supplement it. Yep. They might improve it. Maybe they'll prove disruptive, but uh, uh, I think they'll probably be more complimentary. But whatever the outcome, we need to do better as a community in providing cardiac rehab to our patients. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure.